They came home shot full of holes too numerous to count, with chunks of engine missing and hydraulic fluid bleeding through the gaping tears in the aluminum skin. Love them or hate them, nobody's ever questioned the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt's ability to bring a pilot back safely. It absorbed, as I said, a tremendous amount of uh, damage and would still fly. The inline engine uh, wouldn't absorb anything. The radial engine, you know, we've had, we had cases of people losing several cylinders and still coming back. They would really take, like I said, really take a beating from uh, being shot up or anything more than any other aircraft. They were, they were really a tough bird. There was one case when I was waiting for takeoff and the plane came in and landed and it had been hit in the engine and one piston was flipping up and down on the, in the air and the other piston was gone and the plane flew in and landed and the guy pulled off the runway, he didn't tax it, and he got out. 47 was a great airplane for that. It had absorbed tremendous damage and still fly. Uh, the group commander took it through a tree. Literally, the aircraft went through, the tree was the loser, and the wings didn't come off, but, uh, you know, he just forgot what he was flying and what altitude he was at and went through a pretty large tree. Lots of damage, uh, structural damage on the wings, but the aircraft came home. Uh, I don't think that, a, a 50, I know a 51 wouldn't have done it. I don't think a 40 or I don't think a 38 would have done it. Uh, so it was that kind of an aircraft. I had dropped my bomb, done my job. I headed home, I get back and I land and uh, people are running alongside the aircraft pointing at it as I taxied and I, lean out and look and the whole side is covered with oil and when I got out I got a hole a foot big in the engine and two cylinders missing but it ran fine. For two critical years the P-47 Thunderbolt served as the backbone the US Army Air Force's fighter force battling on every front in every conceivable climate and terrain. The P-47 played a major role in the defeat of the Luftwaffe in the skies over Europe. Yet since the end of World War II, the P-47 has been overshadowed by the fame and glamour of the Lockheed P-38 and North American P-51 Mustang. I think it's, it's comparing a racehorse to a plow horse. Um, the P-47 was the I think you could describe it as the bare knuckles brawler. It wasn't the sleek thoroughbred has the spitfire. It wasn't the graceful, you know, pre-war design of the of the P-38 that was like the Buck Rogers fighter plane of World War II. I mean, the P-38 was what everybody dreamed of. The Thunderbolt, I think, what endeared itself most of all to the pilots was the fact that it had tremendous firepower. It could carry a huge load for ground support, which is exactly what it was best at, I think. And it could take incredible amounts of battle damage. I mean, it, you, you've seen pictures of airplanes that have hit trees. They've got cylinders knocked off the engines. The cowling's gone. Uh, the, the wings are canted back just the leading edge of the wind wings are just beat off the gun barrels are, are are torn from the airplane and it flies all the way home and brings the pilot back i think that is the greatest quality of the airplane by war's end over 15,600 p-47s had been produced more than any other american aircraft save the consolidated b-24 liberator even today, the P-47 Thunderbolt inspires intense emotions amongst the pilots assigned to fly it. After sharing the air with the 47, a pilot either came back a devoted converse or appalled that the Republic ever designed such a monstrous fighter. When I took my training, I took it at Bradley Field in Connecticut, and there were P-40 pilots that were there, and they didn't really, didn't, they didn't fly with you. And all they did was check you out. And they weren't 
they weren't really too enthused with the P-47. So when I went overseas, I did not want to fly the P-47. I wanted to get out of the 38s or 51s. When I got to this base, a P-47 came over there, and he went across that base. He pulled up and did one roll, and we just were in awe, you know. My God, that thing will fly. And I went from one inch tall to 10 foot tall. It was a great experience looking back on it, flying the 47. It was a very forgiving aircraft, but, and the work that we flew it, used it for, it was great. But, you know, it's like anything, a, a driver of a car, airplane drivers are the same way. You fall in love with something and you don't want to trade. You don't want to get rid of the things. And, you know, we weren't smart enough to know that, well, it's probably going to save your life many more times than the 38 might because of, it's not as vulnerable as an inline engine aircraft, whether it's a 40, 51, or, or 38, but it still was not my first love. <laughs> the models that I flew were very sluggish and climbing. In fact, I, don't, I didn't consider it very good until you got to a higher altitude, you know, where your supercharged engine was a big advantage. But I think a pilot Fighter pilot would probably live longer in a P-47 than any other fighter. It's more rugged by far than any other fighter. And we only had them for a short time. They gave us our P-40s, or we were flying P-40s at the time, all the time that we were transitioning into the 47s, and they just decided to take the P-47s away and let us continue with the P-40s. And I think we were all happy about that. Love or hate the P-47, everyone agreed on one thing. It was the toughest fighter ever built. Practically everyone who flew the Thunderbolt has a story to tell about its legendary durability. They speak of holes hacked out of the wing by light flak that were so big, ground crewmen posed with their heads poking through them. Others remember cannon shells severing controls, tearing great gouges out of the cowling. They remember the thumping of the bullets as they slammed into the armor plating behind their seat. And they remember thanking God and Republic for building the P-47 like a brick outhouse. Tough enough to handle the dirtiest of dirty work and built to survive a Kansas tornado. The P-47 owes its genesis to a Russian emigre turned aircraft designer named Alexander Dzeversky. He had come to the United States between the wars and had started his own aircraft company in the 1930s. He was a Russian immigrant who flew during World War I and uh, was a great proponent of pursuit aviation. The P-35 was his original fighter, low-wing, all-metal, retractable landing gear. Uh, the second aircraft was the P-43 Lancer which was a further refinement of the P-35 design. The ultimate was the P-47, which was the final derivative. Just before World War II, Seversky Aviation became Republic Aviation, and the same design team that worked on the P-35 went with Republic and began working on their first major project, which was the P-43 Lancer. And you can see a real clear lineage in the development of the P-47 based on these three designs, the P-35, the P-43, the P-47, all share common characteristics and, and resemble each other. Well, the P-43 went into production shortly after World War II began, and it served as an export fighter. It wasn't something that the U.S. Army Air Force could use, so Republic sent it overseas to the Chinese, where it did not have a very distinguished service career by any means. Designed to be a high-altitude fighter, the P-43 has a top speed of 350 miles an hour and could carry a pair of 50 caliber machine guns in the nose and 430 calibers in the wings. Initially delivered in September 1940, the P-43 impressed some with its high service ceiling of 38,000 feet. Nonetheless, the Lancer proved inferior to most fighters of the day and the Army Air Corps used them only for tactical reconnaissance training in the United States. The P-43 was a failed design. There was no way Republic could look at this as anything but a failure. And here they were in the middle of wartime America. They needed to, to be able to come up with a design that would be effective 
not just from a cost standpoint uh, and a contract standpoint, but also they were interested in building a war-winning aircraft. And they chose to go the evolutionary route. So they studied their, their uh, design. They studied the failure. They examined the reasons why. They got back reports from, from operational uh, units and decided to progress in a slightly different course. But they did extract some of the, the uh, better attributes of the P-43, and they applied them to what became the P-47 program. In 1939, the Army Air Force issued a request for a high-altitude fighter that could use the new turbo-supercharger that Boeing had developed for the B-17 heavy bomber. Such an installation on the fighter would require the plane to be huge indeed, but that didn't deter Republic. After studying the Army Air Force's requirements, the company's chief designer quipped it'll be a dinosaur, but a dinosaur with good proportions. Because of the Army's specifications on this new fighter, Republic chose to design the P-47 around two main features. The first was a brand new engine called the Pratt & Whitney R-2800, which was an 18-cylinder radial engine. It was just monstrous, and it provided 2,000 horsepower, uh, which was far more than uh, most any other engine of its day. So it was a very uh, revolutionary engine. The other thing, that, uh, that they needed to design around was the fact that the turbo supercharger took up a lot of space. So the reason why the, the fuselage for the P-47 is so deep is because of the fact that the engine was so enormous to begin with and the ductwork and the, all the uh, accoutrements for the tu turbo supercharger required a massive amount of space. Dubbed the XP-47B, the new fighter possessed enormous gait. As it sat on its wide, long landing gear, it remained some of a giant milk jug on wheels. As a result, throughout the war, pilots and ground crew rarely referred to the P-47 as anything other than the jug. In June of 1940, this is a year and a half before the war starts. The U.S. Army Air Corps places an order for 773 P-47s with Republic. And this $56 million uh, contract is really a rich plum for Republic to, uh, to get. But it's, it represents quite a risk on the part of the Air Corps with the uh, slender resources that are available at the time. Not only was it risky, but it was a, it was a leap of faith that Republic could actually deliver. At the same time, the fact that they did this a year before the prototype flew was also symptomatic of a larger problem, which was there were so few combat-capable aircraft, especially fighter designs, being conceived of and built in the United States at the time that the Air Force had to take the risk. There really wasn't very many other options. Republic's early test flights of the prototype revealed tremendous potential and more than justified the Army's leap of faith. Though it weighed over five tons, the XP-47 could reach speeds over 400 miles an hour. In fact, at altitude, it was the fastest fighter ever built for the Army Air Force up to that time. Tests also show that the P-47 was an excellent formation aircraft. The 47, when you pulled the power on it, that huge nose out there was like running into a haystack, suddenly equipped. Uh, well, it was easy to fly formation because uh, 38, you'd come in and overrun everybody. And it's the first thing that we all learned when we got <laughs> inline engine. You want to slow down early and sneak up on your flight leader. But on the, on the thir uh, 47, it was a beautiful airplane for flying uh, close, very close. Uh, we tracked or uh, trapped our flight leader one time. Two of us coming up the Irrawaddy River ran into the overlapping wings. And he would go like this, you know, but you wouldn't dare do that in an aircraft that uh, wouldn't stop or start as quickly as a 47. In close formation, uh, you're leading, you're leading on, three guys are flying on another guy. They're not taking their eyes off of it. They're flying on him all the time. They're looking at him all the time, especially if you get into clouds. If you fly in the clouds, you've got to be in tight formation. Otherwise, you can run into one another. And you have a mission. We had a mission one time. I think it was a five-hour mission. We were probably four hours in the clouds. And two flights finished the, finished the mission. The guy was leading the group and my flight. The rest of them went home. 
got in trouble and went home. The first production Thunderbolts rolled off Republic's assembly lines in early 1942. That spring, the Army Air Force decided that the 56th Fighter Group would be the inaugural P-47 outfit in the service. It was a historic decision that laid the foundation for one of the greatest legacies in Air Force history. With its P-47 Thunderbolts, the 56th Fighter Group, by war's end, become one of the highest scoring outfits in history. With dozens of aces in its ranks, the 56 became better known as the Wolf Pack. In the spring of 1942, the recently formed 56 fighter group that had been training with a motley collection of P-40s, P-39s, and AT-6s was given the first production batch of Thunderbolts. Known as Zemke's Wolf Pack, after the commander's hub Zemke, the 56 fighter group would fly P-47s for three years straight while building up a combat history that has become legendary since the war. Hub Zemke was one of those rare pilots who possessed a very interesting blend of talents. One of the things that uh, he is remembered for is his uncanny marksmanship. He was a great shot. He was also a great aviator. He was a tremendous pilot, had phenomenal talent there. But what really makes him stand out and gives him kind of a uniqueness uh, not found in other aces is the fact that he was a great leader of men as well. He could inspire and lead like few men of World War II. And because of that, and plus his other talents in the air, those combined really made him one of the great combat air leaders of World War II. 56 had most of the aces most of the time. And they, 56 wound up with the highest air-to-air -air, uh, victories of any group in the, over in the 8th Air Force, and I think any group in the war. And they had, they were second for total uh, de aircraft destroyed, but they were first in air, uh, air to air combat. I was assigned to the 63rd Squadron, which was Comstock Squadron. And in fact, there was four of us got there, it was, uh, it was four or five, and we all finished our tours. And none of us were shot down. Uh, we, I bailed out once, and the other kids may have gotten the wounded, but no, we all finished our tours. And uh, that was really pretty good. In 1942, while still training in the States, the Wolf Pack received the first P-47s. The unit's pilots soon discovered the new plane could be a handful. With some dangerous characteristics, the Thunderbolt could kill unsuspecting or inexperienced pilots with frightening frequency. You got going real fast and you approached the speed of sound, the plane started tucking. What do you do when it tucks straight down? <laughs> of course, the minute you, you start feeling that you pull the power off. And usually by the time you've changed the air a little bit, it'll start coming out and you're all right. I don't know of anyone, no, I, I there were a couple cases where people did not get the power off fast enough, and they went right straight into the ground. The 56 fighter group suffered many accidents in the course of working up with the P-47 in 1942. The reason for these accidents are pretty varied, but basically the bottom line was this. The pilots who were flying this new airplane were used to T-6s and BT-13s, fairly benign aircraft, and the P-47 represented a new level of power and performance that they really were frankly ill-equipped to deal with. So it was a tricky plane to fly. By the time they went to Europe, they had lost over a dozen pilots in training, which represents about 10% of the group dying before they even got into combat. The pilots had to learn that size didn't matter. The P-47 was simply huge, weighing in at over 13,500 pounds when loaded. With a wingspan of 40 feet and a length of 36 feet and sitting 15 feet off the ground, the P-47 towered over the splendidly legged P-39s and sleek P-40 as the 56 had been flying. The 
P-47 was probably, what was the heaviest fighter that they built? It weighed uh, 14,000 pounds loaded in co when you were going to take off in combat. Despite its size at high altitude, the men of the 56 discovered their new fighter could outperform every other American aircraft, Army, Air Force, or Navy of its day. Its broad wing gave it tremendous agility at heights. Other aircraft could hardly maneuver effectively. Some converts were made right there, fast and brutish looking. The P-47 was the type of plane that could look like it got into a toe-to-toe -to -toe fight, take a beating, but always come out on top. And it could dish out far deadlier punishment than any other World War II fighter with 850 caliber machine guns. The Thunderbolt's firepower was truly awesome. I strafed trains one day and tipped a box car over on its side. Not exploded, just tipped it over from the impact. So the tremendous firepower on those 850. Creighton Gross, a 354th Fighter Group Mustang ace, recalls being the receiving end of a P-47 attack when he was mistaken for an ME-109. P-47s coming in had uh, thought they had two 109, and so they were picking me off. They shot my canopy off. It was gone. My plane did a snap roll was involuntary. And uh, and uh, so I, well, I'm still alive. So I did a spin. Uh, re I went into a spin. I did a recovery and pulled out. And here came the P-47s again. And I rocked my wing frantically. And this guy pulls up alongside of me and goes, oh, and takes off and leaves me there. And, uh, I, I didn't know how badly my plane had been hit. The radio worked, the controls worked. I came back and it, the, the plane had uh, almost a hundred holes in it. Some entry, some leaving, but it was uh, like a sieve. With terrific firepower, excellent high altitude performance, and an airframe built to withstand massive amounts of damage, the man of the 56 fighter group gradually grew to love their P-47 Thunderbolts. By the time the group deployed to New England to join the 8th Air Force in early 1943, its pilots were some of the fiercest P-47 advocates in the Army Air Force. When the 56 fighter group reached England in January of 1943, its pilots were dismayed to learn that they weren't going to be the first P-47 unit into combat after all. As it turned out, the 4th Fighter Group beat them to the punch. Formed from the famous Eagle Squadron the previous year, the 4th Fighter Group converted to Thunderbolts just a few days before the 56 arrived in England. And here, the love-hate relationship that characterized a pilot's relationship with the P-47 began. The man of Don Blakesley's 4th Fighter Group had been used to light the nimble Spitfires. None of them wanted to part with their Spits, especially not for something as huge as ungainly as the Thunderbolt. As much as the 56th Fighter Group loved their P-47s, the 4th despised theirs. The first combat missions flown by the P-47s took place in the spring of 1943. The 8th Air Force had several Thunderbolt groups by then, and the units began flying sweeps over France to get acquainted with air combat. These early P-47 operations in the fighter sweeps over France were plagued by several difficulties. First of all, this was a new aircraft. It had its fair share of mechanical problems that had to be worked out. Secondly, the American pilots were simply green and inexperienced at this point in the war. And lastly, and probably most significantly, they were up against some of the best German fighter pilots at the time, and therefore some of the best in the world. 
and they were flying FW-190As and uh, Messerschmitt 109 gs some of the best fighter aircraft in the world at the time. Then, on April 15th, tax day, Uncle Sam finally received payback for all the money invested in the P-47. A squadron from the 4th Fighter Group while on patrol over France caught two FW-190s in the air and shot them both down. Those would be the only victories the Thunderbolt would have for quite some time. In the first two months of combat operations, the three P-47 groups flew 2,279 sorties, resulting in 10 German planes claimed as destroyed. In return, 1847s had been lost. Both the enemy fire and catastrophic engine failure, and the 56, which had been the biggest supporter of the Thunderbolt, had yet to get its first victory. Finally, on June 12, 1943, the 56 fighter group shot down its first plane, an FW-190. That seemed to break the pilot's bad luck. From then on, the 13th pilots from the 56 surprised the formation of FW-190s and blasted three of them from the sky without a loss. From then on, the 56 went on a rampage, more than earning the nickname, the Wolf Pack. I had a 109, got a 109 I think in December. Uh, we'd uh, chased him from altitude on down and uh, we were really moving going down. And uh, so I just stayed with him, and then I, he went into the clouds, so I pulled back up because I knew I'd overrun him. And sure, up there he came out of the clouds, and I went back down on him again and got on him and hit him right in the right wing, and he started smoking and went on into the, crashed into the trees. So I don't know whether I killed the pilot. I didn't see a shoot. Uh, the 190 I got, the guy bailed out. And the Hinkle 111, I don't know whether, I don't think anybody bailed out of that. I didn't see anybody. I think we'd been escorting, and then if we had a little bit of gas, we might go down and see if we could find up a target of opportunity. And we ran across these guys, about 20 of them. We tangled with them, and we got 15. And we, one guy chased one guy, but he couldn't catch him. And uh, we were on the deck, working on the deck, and I think we could outfly him on the deck. He couldn't, he couldn't get away from me. I could turn in and keep right with him, and so he, I just had him going and going, and he finally decided it was better to get out than to get shot down. Towards the end of the summer of 1943, the P-47C was gradually replaced by the D-Mod. Initially, little distinguished the two versions. Prior to the fall of 1943, uh, the P-47, uh, including the D version, had really not proven itself to be effective as an escort fighter for the 8th Air Force. And the major problem was that they had this fuel guzzling engine and it limited their range so that they were unable to provide cover for the bombers into the main targets inside Germany. And this problem really isn't resolved until the uh, P-47 D-15 model arrives in England. And this model has the ability to put wing tanks underneath each of the wings. Each of those wing tanks is 108 gallons. And that gives the P-47 D-15 the extra range it needs to begin to be effective as an escort fighter for the heavy bomber force. The Thunderbolt now had almost twice the amount of fuel of earlier versions. P-47 soon appeared over Germany within 150 miles of Berlin, wreaking havoc wherever they went. By the spring of 1944, the Thunderbolt had come into its own as a high-altitude escort fighter. Yet just as it reached its zenith, it was eclipsed by the longer-legged P-51 Mustang. As more P-51 Mustangs flooded in England, the Thunderbolts rapidly disappeared from the 8th Air Force inventory until just the 56 fighter group continued to fly them. The 56 refused to change over. They loved their 47s, especially after the new wide-bladed propellers arrived that greatly enhanced the plane's climb rate and acceleration. Also by this point, Republic started to produce a lightweight, more powerful version of the P-47 that only the 56 fighter group used in combat. Designated the P-47M, it was the ultimate Thunderbolt. 
was about 150 of them made, and they all came to the 56 fighter group, except maybe a couple a couple generals got. Actually, it was the best propeller plane that was actually in the war. And uh, I think it was it was clocked at the fast. I think about 470 or 480. I think the 351 is about 460. It was supposed to be the, and we were the fastest. Actually, it was the fastest plane that that the that they had. The P-47M also came with a dramatically increased range, thanks to the advent of larger capacity external fuel tanks. This was the ultimate version of the Thunderbolt in Europe, and was finally able to stay with the bombers all the way through Berlin and back. You just cruise back and forth. If you're top cover, you just kind of weave back and forth. Or if you were maybe over the, at the target, you'd go over the target and you just kind of weave back and forth over the target until all the bombers left and then you'd go back. Usually you'd, you'd either have a duty of taking them in, you'd pick them up at a certain point, you'd take them to a certain point, then another group would relieve you. And then, because we couldn't stay up there that long, see the bombers fly, what, eight, nine, ten hour mission, and depending how far it is, and then uh, you'd go home and they, they would take them so far and then somebody else would pick them up and bring them home. Even in the war's waning months, the P-47 proved to be a formidable air-to-air -air adversary and continued to rack up an impressive toll against the Luftwaffe's best and latest fighters. My squadron flew one mission where uh, I think they shot down 11 long-nosed F-190s. Eight, eight, eight P-47s shot down 11 long-nosed F-190s and didn't lose anybody. But uh, I, I was on the Riviera on R&R &R on that mission. So... By war's end, the 56 fighter group had become the top-scoring 8th Air Force unit in air-to-air -air victories. While the group lost 128 P-47Ss in combat, its pilots shot down 674 German planes and destroyed another 300 on the ground. With almost a thousand planes to its credit, the Wolf Pack had more than proven that when used right, the P-47 could be a terror to all its foes. Throughout 1944, as its long-range escort role diminished, the 9th Air Force adopted the P-47 for a new role. Ground attack. Never designed for low-altitude work, pilots weren't sure how the Thunderbolt would function down on the treetops, shooting up German targets on the ground. Though it didn't perform as well on the deck as it did at 25,000 feet, the P-47 soon more than proved its worth in the new role. In fact, by war's end, it had compiled a record so remarkable that it easily became the best American fighter bomber of the war. Among its many contributions was as, a, uh, as the premier American ground support machine. This was the, uh, the close air support fighter par excellence in the Normandy campaign. In fact, Saving Private Ryan I thought was an excellent movie, but at the end where the tank busters arrive and save the day, uh, their P-51 Mustangs. It would have been, you know, I think, more accurate and more representative of what actually happened to have those be P-47 Thunderbolts doing the, the ground support mission. Because the, the P-47 was a true uh, ground support star, whereas the P-51, uh, yes, it did those missions, but, but that wasn't its major contribution. On the deck, the 47's ruggedness was its greatest asset. Many of the Thunderbolt pilots survived the holocaust of flak and machine gun fire thanks to the sheer toughness of his plane's hide. I was the number four pilot being the youngest, or the newest I should say, and uh, tooling along and suddenly the field out in front just lit up like a Christmas tree. I took something in the right wing that blew off every shell I had out there. I, never, I had not fired around at that time. But uh, it, every, it, it had to have been of incendiary nature because uh, there wasn't any ammunition left when it was all over. It blew the gun tray lid on the four guns out in the right wing up about that high. And of course, holes all over the thing. Headed for home, uh, Decided the damn thing was flying and I would stay with it. 
uh, let down then, oh, probably about 20, 30 miles from home, put the wheels down way out. Everything worked fine, except that the stall speed was all screwed up. Uh, landed, uh, burned the brakes out or not, I really didn't care. They class 2060 airplane anyway. We didn't have repairs for them and with that wing the way it was. I guess I was forever thankful that the darn gear went down. Uh, but, uh, you know, 1,800 rounds and they, they, you could see visible flame in there from whatever hit it, set it off or set the ammunition off. That was, you know, be real proud, even though he didn't like the 47, but having come from 38s, but it absorbed tremendous damage. You know, as far as I was concerned, it was a testimony to the manufacturing talent of the Republic. The Thunderbolt's powerful engine could drag aloft a dizzying array of bombs and rockets, making it amazingly versatile in the fighter-bomber role. We had two 500-pound bombs, and, a, and then normally we carried a frag, fragmentation bomb on the belly, 260-pound frag bomb, uh, which was an anti-personnel bomb. Carried a wide variety of... Uh, bombs and what have you. We carried uh, two 500-pound bombs. Uh, we carried napalm. We carried 1,000-pound uh, straight uh, GPs. Uh, we carried 1,000-pound... They were in a shell similar to a 50-gallon drum, just pure dynamite. They were concussion instruments because some of the areas that we were dive bombing in and uh, on, against troops uh, were steep enough that the uh, concussion, the blast, would kill people. It just depended on what the particular ground support mission uh, requested. As the P-47's role as an escort fighter was eclipsed by the P-51, so grew its role as a ground attack weapon. 9th Air Force P-47s played a tremendously important role from D-Day through to the end of the war, supporting the ground troops as they pushed forward into the right. We were almost entirely there to support troops on the ground. In my case, we were in what we call 29th TAC. The 9th Air Force is organized into three tactical air forces, 9th, 19th, and 29th. And 9th was on the south end, 19th was in the middle, and 29th was on the north end of the U.S. forces as we were going across, toward, across uh, France and Germany. And, and uh, so we supported the, the troops that were in Ninth Army. We would go out and they'd say, armed reconnaissance. And what that meant essentially was, if you see anything moving, go shoot, go hit it. Because at, by that time in the war, the Germans there were no civilian vehicles moving in Germany. They were all related to the military in some way. Even the horse drawn and all that was usually carrying ammunition or, or food or something for the troops. And anything from a single staff car to a convoy of trucks would be a target if it was, if it was moving and we were there. I can recall a mission where we were strafing. There were about four or five large trucks, they weren't semis, they were you know, big vans on a, on a truck chassis and, and uh, just going down the road in convoy and, my, and we were strafing those and uh, there's, they were coming to an intersection, a 90 degree intersection in the road and in, the, in one corner of that was a woods. And as my flight commander was pulling off the target, he, he just had to look down the woods and said, hey, that woods is full of airplanes. So next time around, he made a pass on the woods, strafing. And we hadn't had a shot fired at us till then, and then the whole sky lit up. And he got 104 or five holes in the squadron commander's airplane in the process, <laughs> lost a cylinder off his engine, and, and uh, I was, and lost his radio. I was flying his wing, and he hollered at us, don't come in, and none of the rest of us did. So he's the only one that got hit. But. Uh, he got it home with 104 holes in the airplane and one cylinder missing off the engine <laughs> and so on. And the next day they went back out and, and, and bombed the airfield itself and knocked it out. Tanks were flying targets for the rolling bands of Thunderbolt pilots. 
During the Battle of the Bulge, the P-47 squadrons helped blunt the German attacks on those few days when the weather cleared enough to get the planes aloft. Our target ended up being, uh, it was five, might have been six, Tiger tanks that were parked in, a, in an open field of snow on the ground. So they were probably very, very visible, parked in an open field. And I think probably because of the fuel situation, they were out of, the Germans had no fuel, they were out of fuel. And they had parked them there and lined them up and were using them as artillery. But uh, our, that, those were our targets. And the guy, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a story in my group, but, or in my squadron. I just saw the guy yesterday. Uh, dropped a 500 pound bomb right down the open hatch of a tiger tank. It just happened to go right in the hatch. During the crossing of the line, the 9th Air Force's P-47s once more played a key role in the overall operation. Yet the Germans, with all their proficiency, were able to strike back with desperate intensity. We went up there with bombs and guns and waited to be hollered at for a target, you know, or something like that. We watched the paratroopers go in, and the Germans actually, when the paratroopers crossed, went across, I don't know how high they were, but I would guess five or 6,000 feet, the Germans actually lowered the 88s, the anti-aircraft 88s, and fired so that the shells broke in the amongst the parachutes after the guys were out of the airplane and their chutes were open. And it was, it was pretty bad. I mean, you could just see that. And the gliders came in, they were getting hit too. But, uh, and, and while we were doing that, waiting for a target to be called, we, uh, we had a squadron of British Lancasters come overhead and open their bomb bay doors and start dropping bombs just almost through our formation. Uh, there was a lot of a lot going on, it wasn't all coordinated as well as it could have been. We'd, nobody got hit or hurt, so we were okay. By war's end, Thunderbolt units had destroyed more targets than any other British or American fighter bomber, tens of thousands of trucks, hundreds of tanks, thousands of aircraft, troops, and tons of supply went in flames as a result of marauding P-47 attacks. No other aircraft pack as devastating a punch, and nothing in the air could take the amount of ground fire and get its pilot home as could the beloved P-47. When the world celebrated VE Day, the Jug pilots in the 8th, 12th, 15th, and 9th Air Forces could look back the fight on their accomplishments knowing they played a significant role in defeating the Nazi war machine. While the P-47 played an integral role in the war in Europe, Thunderbolts had less success in the Pacific theater until very late in the war. The major thing that stymed the 47's operational use against the Japanese was its massive fuel consumption. What really uh, shook us up when we were getting uh, P-47s in New Guinea was uh, the way that thing uh, consumed gasoline. It just, fuel consumption was enormous, uh, you know, compared to a P-40. The P-47 represented a lot of challenges to the guys in the 5th Air Force, one of which was the fact that it consumed fuel at such a rapid rate. But when the 348th Fighter Group arrived in the Southwest Pacific, its commanding officer, Neil Kirby, became one of the advocates for the Thunderbolt. And he went all over to different fighter units in the 5th Air Force to try to convince, he was almost uh, evangelical about it, uh, to try to convince the other fighter leaders that this was a terrific aircraft type. He, he was met by stiff resistance, but eventually there were several Thunderbolt groups that were deployed into the Southwest Pacific, and they gradually figured out ways to work around the fuel consumption issues. Half a world away, Claire Chenault's 14th Air Force in China was offered the P-47. Chenault, with his crippling fuel shortage, was not impressed. They took the 47, they ferried them across uh, to, uh, to China. 
And when uh, Chanel found out the kind of fuel consumption the 47 had, he kicked him out of there in one big hurry. Just couldn't afford uh, that kind of a drain on his limited fuel supplies. Though the P-47 never saw widespan use in China, it turned out to be an excellent fighter bomber for Burma. Here, as in many other theaters, the 47's ruggedness saved many lives. Meanwhile, as the front moved closer to Japan and the Central Pacific, the P-47 squadrons of the 7th Air Force were in the vanguard of the advance. When the Marines and Army landed in the Marianas Island in June of 1944, the P-47s of the 318th Fighter Group were operating from the island within just a few days after the invasion of Saipan. Getting to Saipan, however, proved to be a great challenge, unable to ferry them in from any forward Central Pacific air bases. The 7th Air Force resorted to putting the 318th P-47 on escort carriers, the baby flat tops sailed to the Marianas laden with the ungainly thunderbolts. Once off of Saipan, the men of the 318th climbed into their P-47s and catapulted off the narrow carrier decks. Miraculously, not a single P-47 was lost during the operation, and the 318th was soon operating in support of the ground troops from Isley Field on Saipan. It was the only time in history where Thunderbolts were launched from aircraft carriers and had been a rousing success. At war's end, the 7th, 13th, and 5th Air Force's P-47 groups were marshaled around Ishima and Okinawa. Preparation for the invasion of Japan flying ground attack, combat air patrol, and long-range escort engines right up to the Japanese surrender the Pacific Thunderbolts were given a solid, if unspectacular, account of themselves. In one of the last and great Thunderbolt fights, the 318th Fighter Group managed to shoot down 34 kamikazes of Okinawa in the running four-hour battle. The last major production variant of the P-47 was the end model, and about 1,800 were built, and Republic Aviation had designed them specifically to overcome the vast distances involved in the Pacific War. The P-47N had a much greater internal fuel capacity, and they were capable of escorting B-29s all the way to Japan and back from bases on Iwo Jima and Okinawa. When Japan finally surrendered in August of 1945, the Thunderbolt had become the most heavily produced American fighter of its generation, with over 15,000 being produced. As an escort aircraft and ground attack weapon, the P-47 formed the backbone of the Army Air Force's fighter commands through the tough middle years of World War II. In the post-war years, the P-47 quickly disappeared. By the early 1950s, the once omnipresent P-47 had become as scarce as the dodo bird. As the war faded into memory, the Thunderbolt and its accomplishments were steadily obscured by the P-51 Mustang. For 55 years, the P-47 has lived in the P-51's shadow. In reality, no other fighter contributed more to victory than the Thunderbolt. It did the dirty work, the trying ground attack, and close air support missions that held no glory, but saved the lives of countless GIs in the process. The P-47 helped crush the Luftwaffe in the air and on the ground, setting the stage for total Allied air superiority by leading. Workhorse. Loved by some, despised by others, the P-47 ranks as one of the greatest aerial weapons to have ever existed during World War II.
He grew up in tiny Oil City, Pennsylvania, the son of immigrant parents. He showed no interest in flying until 1938 and his college days at Notre Dame. And nearly no one described him as a natural pilot. But he was a natural warrior. He was one of a handful of fighter pilots who launched themselves against the Japanese at Pearl Harbor. His first air combat was fought in a British Spitfire with a Polish fighter squadron. But he would make his mark with the P-47 Thunderbolt, emerging from World War II as the top ace in the European theater with 31 German kills. He would go to war again in Korea and achieve his ace's status a second time, this time in jet fighters. His experience led him to create a completely new set of air combat tactics that saved American lives. He was born Francis Gabrzewski, third of five children of his Polish immigrant parents. They lived in a small town north of Pittsburgh called Oil City and ran the local grocery store. They changed the name to Gabrzewski to make it easier to pronounce. But the boy who would become one of America's greatest air aces spoke his entire life with a pronounced Polish accent. Francis Gabrzewski graduated high school in 1938 just as Hitler's legions marched into Austria. He says his eyes were focused on college, on Notre Dame, and eventually medical school, like his older brother. After Germany's invasion of Poland in 1939, Gabreski knew the United States would be going to war. And when it did, he was determined his weapon would be an airplane. He joined the Army Air Corps as a cadet in 1940. He trained in PT-17 Stearman biplanes with sleek blue and yellow paint. Gabreski admits he was not a natural pilot. He was nervous, always trying to wrestle the airplane around in the sky, compensating for the torque of the radial engines. He nearly didn't make the grade, but he did qualify. And after some advanced training, was allowed to select his first assignment. He chose some place that sounded glamorous, exciting. I chose Hawaii. Hawaii, of course, I mean, it was a glamorous place. I read about it from travelage and so forth. It's a, a beautiful climate. The people are nice and tan, beautiful and so forth. And the girls are even prettier. But so, Gabreski found himself in at the start of the war he knew was coming. I was getting ready for church. And I could hear the bombardment off in the distance. And I paid no attention to it because the Navy does have a range in the mountain. They, uh, they work seven days out of the week. They send that Sunday's one. They probably drop a few of the uh, practice, practice bombs. And then all of a sudden I heard machine gun fire. And that machine gun fire was right next over me. And I looked out the window and sure enough there was a zero flying with his machine guns wide open and so forth strafe and everything before him and i saw the rising sun and that was my first indoctrination into world war ii and of course there's no question about being scared i was scared stiff but at the same time i was trained to do a job we looked at the line and of course the buildings that, that some of the hangar lines were going up in flames the flight line was going up in flames. Our number one job was to move away the intact airplanes away from the burning airplanes. And of course that wasn't easy because all our ammunition was in the hangar line. The hangar line was up in flames and it was just like Roman candles in. In other words, you could see the uh, the tracers coming up and firing, and uh, they were more scary than they were destructive. So we did our work, airmen as well as officers, shoved out the airplanes away from the uh, burning airplanes. And uh, by, the, uh, by the end of, uh, say, an hour, an hour and a half, well, we were able to save about uh, 75 of the 150 airplanes that were parked on, on the line. We did uh, become airborne about uh, two hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor. It was a very, uh, I would say, uh, somber flight. I uh, looked down from about 6,000 feet over Pearl Harbor and saw all those airplanes. It's, it's over off on their side or going up in, in flames. 
and there was just a big, billowing black smoke all over the harbor. With much of the air power of the Pacific gone, and the Navy clearly in charge, Gabreski felt out of the action. The Air Corps found itself trying to salvage what was left of its Pacific bases. Gabreski filled his time reading up on the war in Europe. The Battle of Britain action report showed that the fighter squadrons with the highest kill ratios against the Germans were Spitfires, piloted by members of the Polish Air Force. Gabreski had an idea. He would use his language skills and attach himself to a Polish squadron to learn their combat tactics. He would then pass them along to the Americans when they arrived in Europe. His idea earned him a trip to Washington and a promotion to captain on his way to London. I came over as a casual, I came over as an individual flying with the Polish Air Force to gain experience. So I joined the 315 squadron that was flying Spit 9s, and it was a, just a super airplane. So I flew with them on 20 missions. In February 1943, Gabreski left the Polish squadron. The Americans were arriving in England in force, and it was time to put the lessons learned to the test. He joined the 56th Fighter Squadron of the U.S. 8th Air Force and met his new aircraft, the P-47 Thunderbolt. After the tight quarters and sleek lines of the Spitfire, the Thunderbolt was a battleship. After 20 missions with the, uh, with the uh, Polish Air Force, I joined the 56, which was the first airplane, first group that was coming in intact from the United States of America with a brand new airplane, a P-47. So you can imagine when I went from a Spitfire, which is nothing more than about a 7,500-pound 7, 7, airplane, to this great big belly uh, t a tub that I saw, my God, what a big airplane. It was twice the size of the Spitfire. But uh, uh, it, uh, it, it turned me off immediately, but uh, I, that was the only thing I had to fight with, fight in, and that I was going to learn to fly it. So I took the airplane up, and it was a good airplane. It was a good airplane because it had a turbine supercharger that could derive a 2,000 horsepower uh, at sea level as well as up to 30,000 feet when the velocity of the, of the uh, turbine supercharger would not accelerate any faster because it would de deteriorate, I mean, disintegrate. Unlike the mission of the Spitfire to intercept and shoot down attacking German bombers and fighters, the role of the Thunderbolt was clear. Protect the bombers of the U.S. 8th Air Force. Also, unlike the Luftwaffe and the RAF, he was about to command a unit in a uniquely American Air Corps. We're all amateurs. The Germans were all pros. The RAF, they were pros. And all the Belgium, all the other Allied forces, they were pros by the time that we were there. So we were going to learn from them. And it took us uh, quite a few missions before we felt very comfortable in the operating field where we knew what we were doing. The U.S. 8th Air Force was in Europe to carry out daytime strategic bombing of the enemy. The B-17s were slow, long-range bombers, and the 56th Fighter Group was to escort those bombers to or from the target to protect them from German fighters the best way they could and come home. After a non-combat injury sidelined him for several months, Gabreski came back with a vengeance. On August 24th, 1943, he scored his first confirmed victory at FW-190. On September 2nd, he scored his second.
You're not out there to uh, glamorize uh, the destruction of fighter aircraft. You're there on a specific mission to keep those bombers from being shot down. In other words, if you could scare away, which we have on many occasions, where the uh, Falk Roof 190s and uh, 109s would break off because we'd start coming in head on to them and with our guns wide open and so forth, firing at them. So they'd turn over and get down to the deck. We wouldn't follow them, naturally. I mean, uh, because we did our job. In January 1944, General Jimmy Doolittle, fresh to the 8th Air Force from his North African experience commanding the 15th, changed the general orders for U.S. Fighter Command. The only way to beat the Germans was to eliminate their aircraft and pilots. The role of the fighters was no longer to simply escort bombers. Now they had clearance to pursue and flame every German aircraft they could, in the air or on the ground. February 1944, the 56 went on a binge. Gabreski called it the Big Week. Now flying missions over Germany using extender tanks, the P-47s of the 56 scored 59 kills in five missions. Gabreski owned three of them, running his number to 11. He was now an ace twice over. Now he was racking up kills faster than his crew could keep him in swastika decals. In May, he scored three more kills in a single day, with a fourth listed as probable. By D-Day, June 6, 1944, Gabreski was in contention for the highest ranking ace in the 8th Air Force. Truth be told, he was anxious to match the numbers set by a pilot from his group who had been sent home after 27 air victories. A month later, Gabreski did the impossible. He beat the record with a 28th air victory. He could now go home. Gabreski had been overseas nearly two years and flown 165 missions. His fiancée was waiting with plans to get married as soon as he got home. Gabby was ecstatic. With the exception of an injury to a pinky finger, he had come through without a scratch. Gabreski collected his orders, packed and scheduled to begin the long journey home July 20th, 1944. He stopped by the operations hut on his way out to say goodbye. They were busy preparing to fly another escort mission over Germany. It looked like the kind of mission where a hot pilot could run up another couple of kills. He had 31. Could he score more? Gabreski decided he had one more mission to fly. They found an airfield west of Koblenz and decided to let each of the flights take a crack at it. Gabreski led his flight team down and during his pass exploded a German bomber. He turned to make another pass, hugging the ground too close. The propellers hit and Francis Gabreski, America's hottest air ace, was down in Germany. He would spend the rest of the war in a German POW camp. His Stalag Luft was freed on May 13, 1945. A year later, Lieutenant Colonel Gabby Gabreski, 26 years old and credited with 31 kills, retired from the Army Air Corps. But that's not the end of the story. Like many returning vets, Gabreski was anxious to complete his college degree and take up his married life. He and his wife thought the civilian life looked good, and he managed to snag a job with Douglas Aircraft. It lasted less than a year. Gabreski missed the cockpit and flying. He applied for a permanent commission, and in April 1947, returned to the Army Air Force as a lieutenant colonel. Less than a year later, he was assigned to command the 56th Fighter Group, his old combat unit. 
And with it came promotion to full colonel. It was peacetime work, but not for long. The tension in Korea finally exploded into open warfare, and Gabby found himself watching from the sidelines. The war went back and forth, and it looked like it would be over once MacArthur landed at Incheon. But in mid-1950, a new weapon launched into the skies, and the Americans found themselves fighting a hot new fighter, the MiG-15. Gabreski's command had just made the transition to F-86 Sabre fighters, and he wondered more than once how the planes would stack up. He was going to find out. In May 1951, Colonel Gabreski reported to K-14, the air base near Kimpo, South Korea. Gabreski was assigned to the 4th Fighter Group as Deputy Wing Commander. They had only 50 F-86s, and their mission was to distract the MiGs away from the slower Mustangs and F-80s. To do that, they flew the area the pilots called MiG Alley. When MiG-15 came into the theater, uh, that put another sort of dimension. That's when I went out to, to operate in the, Europe, in the Korean theater. Uh, because the MiG-15 was so superior to any other airplane that we ever had there. So the only offset to that was F-86. F-86, which, which was a... It, it was a, a Mach .9192 airplane, equivalent to the MiG-15. So that put us on par, and it kept, again, the, uh, the MiG-15 from destroying the uh, F-80s and the F-84. And did you get a bounce, cut him off, and drive him in range? When you get in range, shoot, and when you shoot, shoot the kill. Anybody got any questions? Okay, let's go again. On April 1st, 1952, Gabreski led his group back into MiG Alley. He had four kills and wanted his fifth. He went head to head with a MiG-15, and after three passes, he watched the pilot pop his canopy and bail out. He was over his 100 mission limit, though he and another veteran had given orders that their sorties not be posted anymore. But he had had enough. With six and a half kills credited to him and his 31 from World War II, he is the third top air ace in American history. On June 4th, the Air Force sent him home. He had a stop along the way. President Harry Truman called him to the White House and thanked him personally. I've had everything from a squadron to a group to a wing and I've been in the cockpit up until I retired. Colonel Francis Gabreski ended his combat role that summer of 1952, but his career continued. 
He remained in the Air Force until 1967, commanding units at bases from Kadena to Hickam to Adana, Turkey. He had flown aircraft from the old P-40 to the heavy P-47, where he achieved glory. He made the transition to jet fighters in the F-86, and had flown everything up to the F-111 supersonic fighter bomber. His record of 37 and a half kills stands today. He set standards for performance and tactics for all his contributions to the U.S. Air Force. Colonel Francis S. Gabby Gabreski is a legend of air power. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching. Thank you.